You know, we all hear voices in our head. It's just a matter of choosing which ones to listen to. The quote is credited to the brilliant mathematician John Nash, who was also schizophrenic, by the way. I couldn't confirm the quote, but many years before his death in a tragic accident in 2015, Nash had confirmed in an interview that he began hearing voices in his head in 1964 and fought that battle, that internal battle for decades, in and out of mental institutions, ultimately, before ultimately learning how to identify and reject the false. You may have heard of him from the movie A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. Now, I see some heads nodding out there, so let me see. That's a pretty interesting movie, a pretty interesting character, and it, it leads you along to trying to figure out, with, along with him, are the people that he's seeing real. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. Well, whether or not the quote is accurate, it certainly describes our dilemma today concerning which voices we will listen to. Perhaps a better word is multi-dilemma, since die refers to two options, and we have hundreds and thousands of voices that are fighting for our attention every day. And having to sort through all of those voices can be discouraging, since they all claim to be matters of life and death, or at least a better life here on earth. And they continue to pour out and, and work at us and call for our attention, and we have to sort through them. But it, when it comes to the real matters of life and death, the number of voices claiming to speak for God defy our ability to count. To paraphrase God's promise to Abraham, if you can count the stars, then you can number the televangelists. <laughs> However, sorting out truth from among the competing versions and visions of God is far more important because it is a matter of eternal life and death. It is something that has to do with eternity and something that is very important for us because of that. Well, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to continue our series, Glimpses of Glory, Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at one of the five key Old Testament promises we talked about a few weeks ago. This time it's Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 22, and the promise of the prophet who will come, that God will send, and, uh, and the promise there of how God will reveal his message, message and his word to mankind. You're open to, to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to read verses 15 through 22. I think it's worth reading the text because we'll make some references to some things that are in the text as we go through our lesson tonight. Beginning in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 18, verse 15, Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord of my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whosoever will not listen to my word, words which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks the word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has, has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, the Lord has, uh, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. That reading of Deuteronomy chapter 18 is in a context where God is talking about what they're supposed to do and trying to figure out what God has to say. Verses 9 through 14, he's describing the ways they do not go to find God's word. And beginning in verse 15 through the end of the chapter, he tells them how they will be able to find out God's word. What we're going to do tonight as we look at the text and work our way through this idea of Jesus as the prophet, we're going to look at a basic principle. There's going to be a first, a basic principle that God has spoken. That is a core concept of our existence and our faith as children of God is that God has spoken. He has revealed himself to us in some way. 
Then, since we've already looked at John 1, 21, where John the Baptist denied being the prophet, remember that probably from the previous lesson, and we also looked at Hebrews chapters 1 and 2, where it said that God had spoken through prophets in various ways over various periods of time, but now has finally spoken, for the last time spoke through his son, Jesus. And then at the beginning of chapter 2 points out that that is the prophet we need to listen to. If the word of God that was given through the prophets of old had consequences, imagine the consequences of rejecting God's son, who is his final spokesman. But we've already looked at that, so we're not going to go back and, and restudy that in tonight's lesson. Instead, we're going to look at John 5, in verses 39 through 47, which is a, a, a less familiar passage, but nonetheless, it's a passage where Jesus affirms that he fulfills the prophecy about the prophet that was given to Moses. And then we'll conclude with just a couple of crucial tests, crucial tests that, that help us understand how to distinguish between false voices and the true voices, the truth, the voices to which we should listen. So let's look first of all at this first principle, the basic principle, God has spoken. It's important for us to understand that God has not left us out here wandering alone in the darkness, wondering what he wants us to do. He has provided information for us. He has provided the things that we need to know so that we can be pleasing to him. But the first thing we're going to look at is there are two types of revelation that God has given to us. First is through nature or natural revelation, or some people call it general revelation. It's just the, what God has revealed about himself in the things around us. And we'll look at some uh, Romans 1 and, and about that in just a moment. And then there's through words. Remember how we talked about words of the wings that give flight to our ideas? God gave flight to his ideas to mankind, sent them to us with words so that we can know and understand who he is, he is and what he wants from us. Well, let's look first of all at general or natural revelation. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to read a few verses here from Romans 1. And as we look at this, we're going to see that just blazing like a beacon in the middle of this text is, are some things about God that we can see if we're looking, or sounding like a trumpet are some things that we can hear if we will listen. Let's look at what those are in the natural revelation. Beginning in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, we're going to now read down to verse 23. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they know God, or knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So at the beginning of this, this text here in Romans chapter 1, which really is leading into his discussion of how all mankind stands before God as sinners in needing of salvation, he's pointing out there are some things about God that we can know through nature itself, through the things that exist around us. The first thing that we can know, and it's, these are profound things that we can know, but they are knowable, and we have no excuse for ignoring them and refusing to know them. The first thing is we can know that God's existence is undeniable. This kind of permeates through that entire text. The fact that mankind knows that there is a God. And that there are certain things about this God that we're going to look at as well. But the main thing, the point here is that man knows God exists. It is ridiculous to deny it. But man does. Man rejects it. The second thing is that God's power is unstoppable. Look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power. So we can't see God's eternal power, because the only way we can do that is if we were God, and we're not. We can't see it, but we can see the result of it, the effect that his eternal power causes. So God's power is unstoppable. And what that means is that God cannot be contained by the things that he's created. 
He created time and space and matter. He created the universe and this world and us, and we can't contain him. We can't control him. He is beyond our ability to restrict or limit. That's the God that we serve. And that is not obvious from the world around us when we look at how complex and detailed it is. And then the third thing that we see from the text and from nature is that God's deity, his otherness, is unmeasurable. Again, in verse 20, his divine, his eternal power and divine nature, which have been clearly seen by seeing, looking at the things around us. The idea there is that God is other. He is not material. He is not time. He is not the things that he is part of, that he has created. If you watch the Star Wars movies, you know that the Force is this invisible thing that moves through everything, etc., etc., that is these things. No, 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 no. That's not God. That is a blind, unknowable, or unknowing, uh, unable, uh, incapable thing that they create in their mind. God is not contained by nature. He's not controlled by it. He is outside of it. He, that's why he is holy and separate from the things that he has created. Now, what this tells us, this, this is what's called the argument of intelligent design. It's a way that people are trying to get uh, scientists, the scientific world, to accept the fact that when you study science and when you study nature, you find that everything has a design, that there is something behind it there is some, that created it that made it come into being. It was not an accident. Yet that's what the world tries to say. However, I want you to think about something. Think about the, 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 most, the simplest thing that you can think of. Think, like, like this piece of paper. Right? Look at this piece of paper. It's just a piece of paper. Okay? Who would foolishly say, oh, look at what just appeared out of nowhere in my hand, just magically came into existence? Nobody's going to say that. They know that. They know that. But what they will do is they will say the most complex thing. Think now of the most complex thing in this room. You, people, human beings. The most complex thing in the world. They will say all of a sudden that you came into this existence as a being by pure cosmic chance. Accidents. Random accident and short chance. This piece of paper? Ah, oh, it this this man had to make this. You? The most complex thing? Accident. Uh, th that is that's just dishonesty and irrationality at its greatest depth. To say that we came into existence, that the world around us came into existence from nothing. But that's what they say. No creator, no designer, and certainly no God involved in the bringing into existence the world and the people that inhabit it. But sadly, what we have to say to that is the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And what we need to do is we need to recognize that when people say that, don't let them get away with it. They're not going to be able to stand before God and say you don't exist. So don't let them stand before the creation of God and say God doesn't exist either. Point out. When you have the opportunity, do so politely and point out, maybe use that illustration. So you're going to say that this clicketizer here is um, created, but the person who created the clicketizer was an accident. You're going to really say that. You're going to make that as a logical, rational argument when you want to say that God does not exist. Well, that's what they're going to do. Don't give them that chance. Point out the fact that the heavens are telling the glory of God in Psalm 19, verse 1. Well, let's look next at, at special revelation or the revelation through words. God is speaking to us through words. Going back to our text in Deuteronomy, just look very quickly. We're not going to read the text again, but I want you to notice some things from the text, especially verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. And it helps when we go to Deuteronomy instead of Judges. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. He says in verse 18, I will raise up a prophet. So the idea here is that God is going to raise him up. The prophet that is going to be coming is going to be one that God chooses. Man didn't walk along one day and decide, you know what, I think I'm going to speak for God. I'm going to come up with God's 
well, I'm going to reach up to heaven and I'm going to grab God's message and I'm going to bring it down to mankind. No, God chose the people that would speak for him, chose those who were going to be his prophet. And Jesus is the ultimate chosen, as we talked about a few weeks ago in our class in a study on uh, in 1 Thessalonians. God will raise him up. Second is that he will be from among Israel. And Christ was from Nazareth, a Jew, uh, an Israelite of the tribe of Judah, who is the one whom God called and raised up to be his prophet. The third thing we see in the text is that he will be someone like Moses. Moses was a great deliverer. And, of course, what did we find Jesus coming to do? To deliver the people of the world, not just of the Jewish nation, but of all the world, from the slavery to sin. Just like Moses had delivered Israel from their slavery in Egypt. And the fourth thing is that this person will receive God's word. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute in John chapter 5. But this is, the message is coming from God. God is the source of these messages. God is the source of this word. It's not coming from mankind. Jesus even says he didn't make this up on his own, as we're going to see in John 5. The last thing is we are obligated to obey. Let's go to the next thing. Here. Turn over in the New Testament to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And I want us to look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, because Peter is talking about how when Christ was here on earth, and they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, him and uh, James and John were with Jesus, he and James and John were with Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter's using that as evidence that the message that they received is from Christ, it's from God, it's not from man. Verse 20 says, know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, first reading that, we're saying one's own interpretation, we might think, well, that means that I don't have the right to, to decipher myself what it means. And, and that's true, but that's not his point. Read verse 21. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So the idea here of the interpretation is that man didn't make the words up on their own. They came from God. That's the key. This message is from God. And the message that Jesus brought is from God. And we talked a few weeks ago about Jesus as the word. He is God himself. Is the ultimate revelation of God and his message. And Peter went on to add here in 2 Peter that God revealed this message through his, apostle, his uh, prophet, our apostles, that Christ gave them, made them his authorized spokesman here on earth to reveal this message, and that that message was recorded so that people could read it and understand it. In first Peter, uh, Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. So he's saying, I, I've told you this, I've written to you, and now it's the second letter. I'm trying to make you think through these things again. Verse 22, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So Christ is the ultimate spokesman, and all that the apostles speak came from Christ. They didn't make it up on their own. God didn't say, go out and preach and teach, and I'll put my stamp of approval on whatever you say. God said, go out and preach and teach my word. Preach and teach what I am giving to you. That's what he did, and that's how this revelation works. And then in chapter 5, and there in chapter 3 as well, in verses 15 and 16. Kind of throws Paul under the bus here, but study Romans, I guess we can agree with. Verse 15, he says in uh, verse um, 15, in regard to the patience of our Lord and salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, him wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Two things from that. One is that Paul is writing things down that people can read and understand, and that when people distort them, it's their own fault. It's not the fault of the letter, even if they are difficult to understand. The point is they are, are understandable. One other passage along this line, flip over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is making it very clear that he's writing some things down, such as in this letter, and that they 
when they get the letter, can read the letter, can comprehend the letter, can apply the letter. Verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, so this was revealed to him through Christ, but referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he's saying very clearly, what I have written, you can read it, and you can understand it. That's the, gen that's the special revelation. That's what God has revealed to us through Christ. This is it, folks. God spoke in Christ through the apostles who recorded it for us, and we can understand it. We can read it, and we can understand it. We can comprehend it. God has spoken to human beings in language and in words that they can comprehend. Now, that means there's no need for some kind of miraculous enabling by the Holy Spirit to be able to understand and obey. That's one of the side, that's one of the things about Calvinism. And a sad side effect of Calvinism is not only that they teach that you can't understand the Word of God unless the Holy Spirit enables you to it. God gives it to you. Jesus spoke it, but you can't understand it until the Holy Spirit flips a switch or something in you so that you can now understand it. That's their concept. But what that, the side effect is, that leads people to thinking that God gives them special revelation. I worked for a little while with a lady in Bowling Green who was determined that whenever she was in a spot where she needed divine guidance, whatever came out of her mouth, God gave those words directly to her. God get me that God was with me and, and that he was speaking through me. And we had discussions about that. And of course, she was also very biblically ignorant. She was admittedly not a word person. She was a let the spirit lead her by her inner feelings kind of person instead of what the scripture says. But it was a, uh, an interesting set of discussions that we constantly had. But the God was always leading her. And I tried to explain to her, when you claim this new inner leading, what you're saying is God did not reveal enough. He's got to tell you what you need to know. But what you find is not only are they violating scripture, they're also... They receive the, the inner leadings violate the principles, the very principle, and repeat the sins that are in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. In that text, they're going to mediums and spirits and all kinds of things trying to get God's will. And so what they're doing is they're saying they're looking into their own spirit and trying to conceive within themselves what God wants them to think. They're tapping into their own spirit. Which is exactly what God said you didn't need to do. Because God was going to send a prophet to reveal the word. Let's turn to John chapter 5. Let's look over John chapter 5 quickly. And in John chapter 5, you see John talking, uh, Jesus talking to the, uh, the Pharisees and a conflict over who he is who, and his identity. And notice in verse 25 through 27. Let's read those 25, 26, and 27. John 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself, and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Remember how we said that in Deuteronomy, it said that God would give him his word? So God is giving Christ the authority here to act on earth as his emissary, as uh, and th this is the human Jesus who has the authority of God, of deity, of divinity. And then he lists some witnesses to his identity. He says, if I'm claiming to speak for myself, you would be right to question that. So I'm going to give you some witnesses. He said, John the Baptist is a witness, verse 33 through 35. The works, the miraculous works he was doing witnessed to who he is. The Father himself witnessed to who Jesus is. But then he said there's a witness of the scripture. Moses did this. And that's verses 39 through 47. We won't read the whole text here. But he says in verse 39, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. So Jesus makes it clear that what Moses spoke was about Jesus. And specifically the idea here of having received this from God would be that uh, the idea of him being the prophet. But then notice down in verse 46. In verse 45, 
You do not think, verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believe the Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? See the context there? You will hear, we have to believe his words. If they will not believe Moses, who spoke about the final prophet coming, then they're not going to believe Jesus. And they will be held accountable to God for that. His words will condemn those who reject him. The words of Moses will condemn those who reject Jesus. Let's go to the last two things here, the test, the two tests. Do their words come true? We read Deuteronomy 18, verses 21 through 22 earlier. The point there is very clear. If a prophet comes and says he's speaking for God, this would be in the day of miracles, that they were able to work miracles, and they would be telling things that would become uh, coming to pass, as well as things that God wanted them to know about how they should behave. Preach, a prophet did both. He foretold things, events, but also preached God's message of of obedience and repentance, etc. So said, if they come and they say things are going to come to pass and they don't, automatically that person is qualified. Think of all of the religions around us that are built on prophets from the, who made all kinds of prophecies in the past that didn't come to pass, but people still believe them. They should not, we should not believe them. In fact, even um, you know, one claiming to be a prophet had an obligation to prove it, and Moses knew this because he asked for a sign there at the burning bush. And God gave him three that he could use to prove that God had sent him. Any prophet who fails the test, the first time they fail the test, they are proven to be a false teacher. The second test really fits more with us in the fact that we do not have the right to skip today. And that is, does it get agreed with Scripture? Uh, Dennis mentioned in 1 John chapter 4 this morning, 1 John, uh, John chapter 4 verse 1, said, uh, verse 6 says, We are from God, he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You want to know whether or not somebody is telling the truth? Compare it to the scripture. If it, if it complies with what John and Peter and Paul and the other uh, inspired writers of the New Testament said and recorded for us, then it's God's word. But here's the thing, the person who believes God's word is not going to claim that it came from themselves. They're going to recognize and admit that it came from God, that everything that they teach comes from God. The interesting thing about this interleading, the interesting thing about my friend that I worked with for a while is that all her interleading, all quite often her interleading led her to do things to, to do things that contradict the scripture. God said this was true, so scripture said this, but God said that uh, to, to me personally with an interleading, so I'm going to go with what God revealed to me, even though it contradicts scripture. Or it just validates something they've already decided to do, regardless of what Scripture might say about it. Usually a direct contradiction to the truth. Always go back to the text. Always go back to the text. In fact, every speaker, every person who gets up to speak here, whether in a Bible class or in a sermon, whether in a gospel meeting or me or Dennis or anyone else, always take what we say and compare it to Scripture. Look at the scripture. Look at the word of God. Compare it to God's word and see, does it comport with what God said? And if it does not, question, demand, book, chapter, and verse for anything, we, we must, for anything we're told is God's will. Filter anything you hear through scripture. Not through your own interleading, but through scripture. And if you hear something that you think is off, Come talk to us. Maybe Dennis, anybody, talk to us. Because it's important that we are willing to listen. Often what happens, we'll find out that there was a miscommunication, there was a misunderstanding of what was being said, or there was just a misstatement that was not intentional, and sometimes both, and once that's corrected, everything's good. As long as you come back to the scripture to see that that's what God said. But sometimes there's a clear misunderstanding and mis statement about what scripture said. And that needs to be addressed and dealt with. Kind of, 
gently, lovingly, but it needs to be dealt with. You know, there's a saying, I, I, I heard it from a guy the other day, I was listening to a sermon uh, the other day, and the guy said, if we say anything that you do not believe is scriptural, you would be my friend if you came and told me about it. Remember hearing that a lot as growing up? We don't say it as much anymore. Maybe we need to go back to that to remind ourselves that anything that we say needs to be validated by Scripture. Not by the weight of anyone's authority, but by Scripture, by God's authority. The key to this is free and open discussions. Because when we do that, when we have these free and open discussions of God's Word, figure out what are the right voices to listen to. What well, way get some books out we're going to wrap up with a couple of the questions. It's a simple question. God has spoken. God has spoken. Are we listening? He has spoken to us through the world. He has spoken to us through his son. He has spoken to us through the apostles and authorized writers of the New Testament. Are we listening? If we're not, we're going to answer to God. We're going to answer to me. To me, it's always been amusing when I'd be around I don't know if amusing is the right word, but it'd be interesting when I'm around somebody and they'll let out a curse word. And they'll look at me and say, oh, I'm sorry. And I guess what I like, my standard, my standard response is, don't apologize to me. I'm not the one you offended. You have to deal with God on that. We answer to God. I'm going to be able to stand before him and say, I'll listen to you. And hear him say, welcome, my good and faithful servant. That's our goal. That's your goal. And I hope it is your goal. You need in any way to make your life right with God, whether it's to obey for the first time or whether it's to return to Christ. Please come while we stand.